to show up, so we better start. So uh, my name is Armando Migliaccio. I'm, uh, I work for HP uh, as a Nova, a Neutron core developer. I used to be a Nova developer. Um, oh, see, another one is coming in. Welcome. <laughs> um, so before we, we, we share this presentation with you, uh, I, I'd like to, um, to set the context um, a bit. Uh, when, when dealing with uh, I mean, bandwidth guarantees or like quality of service in, uh, in more general terms, there are a few elements that um, can make this, this problem particularly tricky to deal with. And um, quality of service can be, you know, uh, can be seen by uh, many people as, as an overloaded term. Uh, obviously, it's mostly a networking concern, but it can apply in other contexts like compute and storage. Here, we're, we'll, be, we'll be talking about networking um, specifically. And um, um, from an open source perspective, when, uh, you know, in, op in OpenStack in, in particular, um, when multiple parties try to um, come up with their with a common logical representation of the problem and the potential solution to that problem, uh, it can be tricky to, um, to get that logical representation and map it to multiple different technologies and, and, and specific vendor solutions. And uh, these, um, this can also be made particularly tricky when, uh, and, and challenging when applying that particular logical uh, solution to, to the heterogeneous uh, cloud provider environment that, that can be out there. And um, even when, when that logical model has been agreed upon, uh, it can be uh, challenging um, determining whether that logical model is, is considered like the, game, the foundation, the, you know, the, core of the, of, uh, uh, the core of it, and what can be seen as you know, extensions that, that, can be, that can be used to diversify a specific solution. Um, when thinking about, you know, when in OpenStack in the past, um, this, this, this aspect has been, has been dealt in a, in a number of ways and uh, in, in, in various projects with mixed results in Neutron, we've looked at this space um, in the past and um, there have been again mixed results um, what we can what we can certainly say is that um, we haven't we haven't looked at it from an holistic point of view and there hasn't been like a coordinated approach that uh, meant that uh, this again this aspect has, uh, um, has been looked at from again from from uh, from more than one, one than more than one project at once um, so um, I, I am going to now hand over to, to Yoshio, and he's gonna like have a deep dive in, into into this um, bandwidth limiting uh, guarantees uh, experiment that HP has been has been involved in. Thanks, Armando. So I'm Yoshio. I used to work at HP Labs. Um, so Armando painted a picture about QoS kind of spanning multiple dimensions: networking, storage, compute. And I'm going to kind of drill down on um, networking quality of service, and in particular, bandwidth guarantees. There are many other kinds of aspects to network quality of service, like latency, prioritization, um, limits on packet losses, and so forth. But I'm just going to focus on bandwidth guarantees. And even within that context, um, that's also a fairly broad topic, because there's many different ways to express bandwidth guarantees. And we're going to do, describe just one technique that we have some experience with. So why would you want bandwidth guarantees? For me, the main reason is that we want to provide insulation from noisy neighbors. If you have multiple tenants sharing a, a, a network in a cloud, you want to, to have the property that um, if one tenant is using a lot of bandwidth in the network, that should not disrupt the application level performance that different tenants receive. So really, I view bandwidth guarantees as a mechanism um, for providing predictable application level performance, throughput, and response times. And it's really not just a performance issue. It can also be a reliability and uptime issue. If you have um, such a severe disruption of your performance that it leads to application level timeouts, for example, this can lead to cascading failures in downtime of your service. 
And second reason you may want bandwidth guarantees is to provide a richer level of, um, a richer uh, specification of service level agreements between the cloud provider and um, the consumers. And finally, you may want to have bandwidth guarantees to provide special service for special flows like uh, video, for example. I'm not going to talk much more about that, although I think it is an important topic. So if we look at the work that's been done previously on cloud network performance, there's been a lot of work done in the uh, research community. And then, uh, a bunch of papers are listed there. If you look at ACM SIGCOM, for example, and uh, Usenix NSDI conference, you see a lot of uh, work that's been done over the years in both academia and industry, um, representing you know, a lot of smart people working very hard to come up with innovative solutions to provide you know, better fairness or bandwidth guarantees and so forth. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of this work has kind of uh, stopped there. At least as far as we know, they have not been uh, uh, put forward in a, in, a, in a manner that is open for widespread consumption. So like as an open source solution that's easily consumable by lots of people. If we look at what's happening in OpenStack, there have been some vendor plugins that provide some level of assurance for bandwidth. And recently, there's an effort in Neutron to define a flexible QoS API. And that looks really interesting to us. So in HP Labs, we decided to take two efforts that we did that were related, Gatekeeper and Elasticsearch, and implement them on OpenStack as a proof of concept. And the hope is that that this work, as we share it with the community, can be used to kind of bridge the gap between some of this research work and the, uh, what's available in OpenStack and freely consumable. So let's look a little bit more at Gatekeeper and Elasticsearch. Both of them provide a very similar abstraction to the cloud tenant. Um, the cloud tenant sees a virtual network, and the virtual network from a bandwidth perspective uh, should behave like all the VMs of that virtual network are attached to one big switch with links with um, a guaranteed bandwidth capacity. So any traffic pattern that such a one big switch could support, the network, the real, the virtual network should be able to support. And so it's really the job of Gatekeeper and Elasticsearch to provide this performance property of this one big switch abstraction even though these virtual machines are, uh, are in reality distributed across the network um, and interconnected by potentially several switches. So on a, uh, if we want to understand a little bit more deeply how Gatekeeper and Elasticsearch work, here we have on the top Gatekeeper on the bottom Elasticsearch. The basic trade-off between these is that um, Gatekeeper is a simpler mechanism and uh, Elasticsearch provides finer control than Gatekeeper. So let's look more deeply into how these work. So Gatekeeper, the basic strategy, well, let's, before we talk about that, let's talk about a common concern, which is admission control. When we place virtual machines uh, or instances on a cloud network, we want to make sure that they don't over-allocate the, the network resources that they need. In the case of Gatekeeper, uh, the only thing we check is that we're not oversubscribing the host NIC. So as virtual machines land on a, on a compute node, they, take, they allocate portions of that NIC's bandwidth, and we, don't want to make we want to make sure that the sum of those allocations doesn't exceed the NIC bandwidth. For Elasticsearch, we do the same thing. But in addition, Elasticsearch considers what's happening inside the network core as well, and tries to make sure that we're not over-allocating resources in the network core whereas Gatekeeper assumes that the network core is well-provisioned and is not the bottleneck. Okay, so now let's look at the, the different mechanisms. So the basic strategy Gatekeeper uses is to use weighted packet schedulers on every compute node. And in our implementation, we are using uh, the Linux traffic control subsystem to do this, which has very uh, rich mechanisms for queuing and scheduling of packets. And it turns out that just using this mechanism and configuring it right provides that one big switch guarantee for as long as all the traffic is congestion-controlled TCP. 
However, not all traffic is, con is congestion control TCP, so Gatekeeper has kind of a fallback mechanism. It's constantly monitoring the traffic rates and identifying non-compliant traffic. And once the traffic is um, identified, uh, compute node to compute node, hypervisor to hypervisor signaling occurs that causes the transmission side to have stricter uh, rate limits when it receives these congestion notifications. So that's the basic strategy that Gatekeeper uses. For Elasticsearch, it's a little bit different. Elasticsearch sets up um, all pairs virtual machine to virtual machine tunnels. And on each tunnel, it monitors the traffic on that tunnel, the demand for the traffic on that tunnel, and also the congestion experienced by that traffic in the network. These metrics are then exchanged between communicating hypervisor nodes, and that information is used to dynamically control a rate limit, a transmission rate limit on each tunnel. And in this manner, it provides that one big switch abstraction. Okay, now I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Jun Young, who's going to talk about the OpenStack-specific implementation. Okay, thank you, Osio. Uh, my name is Jun Myung, uh, who is working for HP Labs right now. Um, I'm going to talk about more details uh, in terms of how to integrate gatekeepers on OpenStack. Um, because of time constraint, uh, uh, we don't want to cover the last switch implementation of OpenStack, uh, but currently we have uh, implemented the last switches uh, based on similar approaches, which I'm going to talk about now. Okay, I'm going to start from the architectural designs uh, for integrating gatekeeper on OpenStack. Okay. Currently, we have developed a, a gatekeeper based on the uh, uh, OpenStack Kilo release as well as the Juno release. So when we try to deploy the OpenStack, we can use maybe different types of deploy deployment model. So I'm going to show the very simple models uh, based on one controller and several compute nodes. When we consider some networking part in OpenStack, so we can run the, we are running the neutron servers on each co uh, controller part. So we can also uh, use some different types of plugins on Neutron. Well, for example, uh, when you try to run the ML2 plugin, so maybe you can, you can use some um, different types of type drivers and mechanism drivers for supporting networking part. And there are um, several compute nodes, which include hypervisor and some agent modules for supporting this uh, OpenStack. As Yoshio mentioned previously, we are currently running a uh, gatekeeper and last switch on the comp uh, hypervisor. So currently, we are running the gatekeeper in each compute node. Gatekeeper uh, try to monitor the network status from the NIC, and then it can try to uh, exchange all control messages uh, between all uh, gatekeeper, and then it can control the NIC for the uh, based on the given bandwidth guarantee. Okay. When we try to integrate this gatekeeper on the open stack, so we need some additional information uh, for this bandwidth, uh, bandwidth guarantee. Okay. We have to uh, define some minimum and maximum bandwidth for tenant, virtual network, or the port. But there was no available uh, APIs for setting this information uh, in the neutron. Actually, currently the Neutron QS group is trying to define these QS APIs, uh, such as the QS policies, which includes the minimum and maximum bandwidth information. But there was a, if there, uh, because there were no available APIs, we have defined our own bandwidth guarantee API extension. Also, we need to develop the gatekeeper uh, mechanism driver for supporting additional information for bandwidth guarantee. And also, we need uh, agent extensions, which can take the information from the control part, and then it can pass that information to the gatekeeper. For example, when a user set the minimum and maximum bandwidth uh, for each port or tenant, we have extended the port update APIs, which is already exist in the neutron APIs, by adding two more attributes, minimum and maximum bandwidth. 
and then it can pass to the uh, gatekeeper mechanism driver. Gatekeeper mechanism driver uh, passes uh, this information to the gatekeeper agent extensions. After taking these values from the gatekeeper mechanism driver, it passes these values to the gatekeeper. After getting the given a bandwidth guarantee, gatekeeper trying to provide the bandwidth guarantee. Because gatekeeper provide a bandwidth guarantee in this cloud data center, so we have uh, uh, applied this information to the uh, Nova scheduler. As you can see, uh, there's a Nova scheduler in the control node. We have a Nova compute, node, compute server, a compute agent in the compute node. Okay. Currently, we can uh, use only uh, computing resources for implementing the Nova filter functions for scheduler such as a uh, um, number of virtual CPUs, amount of memories, amount of storages. There is no uh, networking related resources for flavor. In this case, uh, we have uh, modified the Nova compute to report available bandwidth info to the Nova scheduler. So we have, uh, uh, oh, sorry, developed, the, we have modified the filter function for supporting this available bandwidth info for the Nova scheduler. This is one of the useful information which we can use of uh, this available bandwidth info for the scheduling. Okay. I'm gonna talk about more, uh, one, one more examples with, without the bandwidth guarantee. We are assuming that use, uh, we are using the maybe Coalink as a 10 gig BPS, and then we have uh, two tenants, blue and red. And we're gonna launch two virtual machines, one compute node, for the blue and red tenant. The first, uh, we're gonna generate one TCP floor in blue tenant. We're gonna generate 16 UDP floors in the red tenant. So in this compute node, uh, what happens in this compute node when we have these traffics? There is a bottleneck in this compute node. I'm gonna show the result without this guarantee. Okay, if there is no traffic in the red tenant here, in the blue tenant, we can get a more than 8 giga BPS as a maximum throughput. But if we have uh, some traffic in the red tenant, that's UDP traffic, so it can consume, it consumes all of the bandwidth because TCP suffers from the, this UDP traffic. So we cannot guarantee the bandwidth for this uh, blue tenant. Okay. If we don't have any mechanism for bandwidth guarantee, so we cannot provide any this mechanism in the open stack. Okay, I'm gonna show the one result based on our gatekeeper implementation on open stack. Uh, we're gonna set the eight giga BPS as a minimum and maximum bandwidth for blue tenant, and we're gonna set the two giga BPS for the as a minimum and maximum bandwidth for this red tenant. As you can see in the pie chart. This tenant, uh, blue and red ten tenant, shared this bandwidth based on the given bandwidth guarantee. Okay. And this red tenant, if there is, a, uh, because there is a, a five compute node, gatekeeper is equally assigned the uh, available bandwidth for the each compute node. Okay. I'm gonna show the more examples uh, when you have the multiple tenants. Okay. We are setting the same minimum maximum rate for all multiple tenants. So maybe up to the five tenants. So we have some all mixed the TCP and UDP floors in each tenant. I'm gonna talk about uh, work conserving here. So we have only one uh, traffic in the one tenant. So even though we set that, uh, some small amount of uh, uh, minimum bandwidth, so it, we can get a more than a more uh, throughput if there is a, a no competitive uh, tenant here. And also, uh, we ca uh, gatekeeper can share all the bandwidth evenly for the different uh, multiple tenants. Even though we showed only five tenants here, we already uh, ex uh, tested uh, more than maybe several hundred tenants. The gatekeeper can assign the all the bandwidth evenly based on the given bandwidth, uh, minimum, maximum bandwidth guarantee. Okay, uh, next, uh, Mario will show the more practical and interesting demonstrations 
instead of this static result. Okay, now Mario. Thanks, Yumi. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mario, as Yumi said, and I will be sharing with you a video demo of our implementation of Gatekeeper, so that hopefully nothing will go wrong because it's recorded, so that should be fine. <laughs> There is. Okay, so um, basically in this scenario, um, we're going to, uh, we have uh, two tenants again, the blue and red tenants. In this case, the blue tenant has two VMs, the red tenant has three VMs, and all five VMs are going to be split across four different uh, compute nodes. Um, each of the compute nodes are connected to the network uh, through 10 gig NICs, and the bandwidth between uh, them in the network available for the compute nodes is 10 gigs as well. So in this case, we are just fast forwarding the video a little bit to show you uh, the automatic creation of these five VMs in these particular four compute nodes. And we're showing you on the right just a horizon view of these VMs being created automatically. We decided to create them using Python script. We could have used HIT or something similar, but we just decided to use Python in this case. So um, next, I'm going to be dragging to the left uh, uh, three terminals, which correspond to the consoles of the three VMs on the left. Uh, blue tenants VM1 and red tenants VM3 and 5. And the figure on the bottom of the screen is going to show the throughput as seen on the two, two VMs on the right side of the screen. VMs2 for uh, blue tenant, a VM4 uh, for red tenant in this case. Um, so uh, once this is set up, we're going to start with uh, an experiment where with, there are no bandwidth guarantees. And we have a scenario where the blue tenant sends a single TCP connection uh, from VM1 to VM2. And what, as we expect, we see that the TCP connection is able to get all the available bandwidth to it since there's no competing traffic in this particular scenario. Um, next, we're going to receive, uh, repeat the same scenario, but we're going to start injecting UDP traffic from the red tenant, and specifically from VM3 and 5 towards VM4 on the right side of the screen. And what we see is that the moment that UDP traffic starts flowing on the network, just like you showed before, uh, UDP basically hogs the entire available bandwidth and TCP basically dies. This is no surprise. We, this is exactly what we would expect would happen given that we have no bandwidth guarantees, right? So in this case, when the UDP flows actually die, we see that TCP is able to recover and to take all the available bandwidth to itself until the actual flow is completed. Uh, so next, uh, what we're going to do is show the same scenario, but by first activating our gatekeeper component in, this, uh, in our desktop, dev stack configuration. And in this case, we're going to be setting the minimum rate guarantees and maximum rate limits to be the same values for each of the different VMs and different tenants. In this particular case, we're going to be setting the, uh, the VMs for the blue tenant to have a minimum and maximum of 5 gigs, and the red tenant to have a minimum and maximum of 2 gigs. Uh, in this case, um, we're just, again, doing a very fast forward of the video to show you how we, we are using Horizon, an extended uh, Horizon, so that we can set the minimum and maximum for each of the ports that are attached to each of the VMs in the different tenants. In this case, we simply, um, uh, if you can see on the right, we've extended uh, Horizon so that it exposes the new attributes that we've attached to the different ports in, in, in Neutron when they are created. So in this particular case, again, we're just setting up uh, the minimum and maximum to be the same values. For the blue tenant, they're being set to 5 gigs. And for the red tenant, they're being set for 2 gigs. So next, we just repeat the same experiment. And what we see is that um, once the TCP flow starts, it is quickly limited to the 5 gigs guarantee that it was set. Um, and when we start the UDP flows, it also is limited to the 2 gig guarantee that it was provided. But more importantly is the fact that the UDP flow is no longer interfering with the TCP traffic. And once UDP flow dies, the TCP uh, flow continues happily until it, it finishes by achieving the 5 gig throughput uh, that we've assigned to it, the minimum guarantee that we assigned to it. So finally, uh, we're going to show you a uh, last experiment where we're going to set the maximum rate limits greater to the minimum rate guarantees. In this case, we're going to be setting uh, the, for, for all of the VM for the blue and red tenant, we're going to be setting for the blue VMs, we're going to be setting a min and max of 5 and 8 gigs respectively, and 2 and 8 for the red VMs. In this case, uh, by setting maximum greater than min, 
the tenants will be able to use more bandwidth than its minimum guaranteed bandwidth as long as there's enough available bandwidth, unused bandwidth in the network. And in this case, um, we're again doing our magic and just setting up the ports to the specified values, two and eight and five and eight respectively. And then we're just going to repeat the same experiment. So what we'll see next is that when the TCP flow starts, it, it, is, it will be able to achieve more than its five gig guarantee, but it will be limited to the five gigs max rate limit that we set for it. Next, we're gonna start the UDP flow and we're going to see that UDP as well is able to achieve more than its minimum of two gigs, but less than its eight, maximum eight gigs. And what we're going to see then is that when the UDP flow dies, you, you, uh, the TCP flow will start going up again and we'll, we'll be using the available bandwidth up to the maximum that it was set for, is, for it. In this particular case, uh, we're showing that in this scenario where the maximum is greater than the minimum, we are uh, showing a work conserving uh, strategy um, but what we are, where we are able to better utilize the bandwidth on the network with the caveat that we are doing this um, and we are sacrificing predictability and the ter uh, the term, uh, uh, predictability on the network in this case. Uh, so I'm going to hand it back to Yoshio now. Okay, I just want to talk about a few challenges that we see for kind of getting this stuff into OpenStack, that some of the things that we encountered. So maybe the main difficulty was the cross-project dependency that Jun Myung alluded to for the um, admission control, where we basically had to modify the notion of the host resource and uh, extend the Nova scheduler a little bit. So um, that's a kind of dependency that we'd like to get away from. In the longer term, it looks like there's an effort to move scheduler out of Nova, and, and that seems like a, a, a better fix for this in the longer term. But in the shorter term, we might be able to sidestep the issue um, and eliminate this dependency by a strategy of uh, proportional resource allocation. If you allocate the network bandwidth in proportion to some other resource that Nova scheduler knows about, like memory, then if you set the proportion right, then you can always ensure that you run out of memory before you run out of uh, bandwidth. And so then you kind of eliminate that dependency. But it's a, it's a kind of a trick. Uh, the other issue that we had is that both Gatekeeper and Elasticsearch um, work by implementing a Linux kernel module. And in the case of, of Gatekeeper, this is mostly for fine-grained monitoring of the flows. And this is kind of a non-starter for contribution to OpenStack First, we'd have to contribute to Linux and get that accepted before OpenStack could consume it. So that's really not going to go very far. So what we're doing now is we're looking at an interim solution that would eliminate the kernel module and uh, leverage existing features in Open vSwitch to get an almost as good solution. So looking forward, we're hoping that um, this work that we've done um, can be useful for the community, and we hope that you know over time that the code can be contributed and be you know useful for people. Um, we'd like to work with the uh, Neutron QoS group and uh, the community to really make bandwidth guarantees a reality uh, for everyone. Um, so we've been thinking about how we might uh, stage the contribution uh, that we've done, you know, and f figure out how to contribute it in kind of bite-sized chunks that would be easily consumable by the OpenStack community. So one possible uh, staging is shown here, where you could take the static rate limiters, which Gatekeeper uses to control traffic for um, TCP, and it's really just configuration of uh, Linux traffic control, and use that as kind of an initial contribution. Um, and then going forward, add the congestion signaling mechanism between the hypervisors. Um, again, this was, does not involve any interaction with the controller. And then finally, you know, over time, we could uh, implement more precise monitoring in the Linux kernel, hopefully get that accepted, and then pull back into OpenStack. Um, some other things that we uh, kind of encountered along the way, so it's shown on the bottom here. So one issue is that 
bandwidth in terms of megabits per second is not the only thing you need to think about in terms of bandwidth, in terms of guarantees, even throughput guarantees. Packet rate is also important, the number of packets per second that you're processing, because especially for UDP traffic, the amount of CPU that you're using to process every packet, if the packet rates are high enough, this becomes a very significant factor and can even become the bottleneck before your, um, your bandwidth bit per second becomes the bottleneck. Um, and of course, we're, uh, a lot of services are really concerned about latency more than bandwidth. And so we need a solution that kind of balances these two concerns. We currently rely on uh, hypervisor level support for the signaling. Um, so I think, you know, over the longer term, we're going to need solutions that can work for bare metal hosts as well. And finally, we've adopted the um, one big switch performance model called the hose model. There are other models in the literature that uh, might be interesting to look at over the longer term. And of course, there are things like per prior, uh, priority per flow, per flow guarantees and so forth. Okay, so I'd like to uh, hand it back to Armando to close it out. Oh, uh, thanks, Joshua. I mean, uh, yeah, before we, I, uh, we open up at, to Q&A, obviously I want to thank everyone for sticking around. So if you have any, any energy left and you would like us to uh, um, challenge with questions, uh, please go ahead. Um, and uh, here are a couple of pointers on these slides. I mean, in the Liberty time frame, uh, this problem space will be looked with, uh, you know, uh, lots of interest and we'll try to, to make progress. So um, there you'll see a couple of pointers where you can you know, stay abreast of developments. Uh, in the next couple of days there will be a couple of sessions that uh, may be of interest to you. I'm not sure whether the rooms will be big enough for uh, you know, fitting everyone. Um, but I mean there are other parts associated to those rooms and that's like the, those are the tools that can be used to again to, to stay up to date. So there is a person at the mic so I, I was just wondering I, 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 maybe I missed how you exactly you were doing enforcement in this so in gatekeeper there's two mechanisms one mechanism is to provide packet schedulers at the endpoints at the compute nodes that is sufficient for a lot of TCP traffic for non congestion control traffic we do send feedback messages from one hypervisor node to another so agent to agent level and, and then when such a feedback is received, the receiving agent imposes harsher rate limits on the transmission side. And where are the packet schedulers sitting? Are they at the hypervisor level? They're in the, in, yeah, in the, in the Linux kernel, in, okay. the, in the host, in the compute node host. Oh, in the compute, okay, okay. Hey, uh, so I have one question regarding the min and max guarantee and uh, work conserving aspect of uh, your product. So let's say if I, uh, for a TCP uh, traffic, I set a minimum ban uh, bandwidth to two gigs. And uh, let's say that uh, flow is right now currently not sending anything. And then there are like competing uh, UDP traffic if they can go up to like, you know, let's say 10 gigs. So do you allow that or? Yeah, we, we allow that and we make, and the way we can get around that is to make sure we never allocate the full NIC bandwidth. We allocate like 90% of it. So there's always a headroom, and when we're above that headroom, then we're suspicious that, that there's some flows that are not getting their minimum guarantee, and we send feedback in that case kind of proactively. So and that's the way that we kind of avoid having to do rate limiting and feedback in the network itself, but we can do it on the host. So, uh, so my question was uh, like, you know, just clarifying. Uh, so the UDP traffic which is currently running would get like the full 10 gig? It would not get full 10 gig, but it can get up into this headroom area and then would get rate limited. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, first thing is uh, this is a really cool demo and presentation, so thank you so much. And uh, I also have a couple of questions I uh, need clarification. The first one is, uh, does this solution really work if, for example, my VM have a uh, north and south bound of traffic? Uh, in other words, the, the traffic does not really that's an eye to another VM instead of go somewhere into the internet. Uh, and then in, the, in this case, does this solution really work? Yeah, for north-south um, traffic, this is a concern. And you know, you basically, if you wanted to adopt these kinds of mechanisms, you'd have to have kind of a gatekeeper proxy or something that's sitting on like edge at the edge. Yeah, I see. And, I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another thing is from an architecture perspective, uh, I saw in your diagram 
uh, there's a maintenance driver, which is gate, gate, gatekeeper driver, right? And the gatekeeper driver, if I remember correctly, talked to the OBS agent. There is the extension there, and from there, actually, you send instruction to the gatekeeper on the compute node. So is there a reason why you have to go through the OBS agent? Why, why not your driver just communicate with the gatekeeper on the, commute, uh, on the compute node directly? Do you want to? Actually, in this case, there is no reason to depend on OBS at all. We just decided to do it for this particular POC. But we could just as easily create our own agent on the compute nodes that talk directly to the, to the demons to set the speeds. It, it, yeah, but, but yes, absolutely, you're right. OK, so in other words, this actually OBS agent does not involve right. in this case for any purpose. It's not required. Control. Right. OK, yeah. awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all my questions. Thank you so okay. much. Hi. My question is very re relevant to the first question of the previous speaker. It's about bandwidth guarantees when the backend network is over-provisioned. So you mentioned the uh, gatekeeper uh, can have agents uh, deployed on top of rack switch or aggregation layer switch where they are reporting back all the usage, right? Is this a model you're going after? No, this is really all, all a gatekeeper does is uh, lives at the, on the compute nodes. Right. And there's uh, really no support in the network fabric itself. Um, for for Elastic Switch, we've have done experiments where we are taking advantage of ECN capability in the network to get better indication of congestion um, that the individual tunnels are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So going forward, if you want to include this support, then uh, having appropriate models deployed across each our pass is a uh, uh, yeah that can only make it. That can only make it, you know, better, a, a more uh, accurate. Because right now we're kind of inferring things based right. on on end-to-end -end behavior. But if we got right. explicit signals from the middle of the fabric, then you could do a better job. Okay. And it, is this on your roadmap or something later? It might be on HP's roadmap. <laughs> okay. Got it. I don't know. <laughs> sure. Thanks. I have one question regarding um, scalability. So, do you have can you touch a word about the protocol that you're using for uh, Gatekeeper? On what network you run this protocol and how scalable can it be? If you can have very large number of compute nodes, right? Yeah, so, um, so we do a few tricks to make it, to, to gain scalability. Um, so basically you're talking about how we send the feedback in a scalable way, right? So we have, a, um, we have this notion of severity of the feedback and if you send feedback and you find that you're not getting the response that you expected because maybe there's too many senders and it would take you, you know, a long time to send to, lot, to all of them. Then what we do is we start bumping up the severity that we send back to the individual um, transmitters. And the severity, what it does is it causes them to recover their original rates slow, more slowly than they would otherwise. So it's kind of like a, uh, if you're familiar with TCP behavior where you have the additive increase, multiplicative decrease, we do, they go through the same multiplicative decrease, but with added severity, they, the, 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 with increasing severity, the, the additive increase part becomes much slower. And so over time, you know, if, no matter how many senders you have, eventually the severity is so high that they recover in the aggregate kind of like a single flow would. And um, is it based on UDP or you're using something else? Or? Um, yeah, so I actually don't remember. <laughs> yeah, they are UDP messages that are being sent between the, the compute nodes and are being intercepted when they are received on the other side. Yeah. Uh, and, and what um, network are you using for carrying this traffic? What network? Yes. Oh. It's, it's a 10 gig Ethernet. So um, is it the same LAN? interface on the data path for, for DVMs or is it a different? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's in band. So um, the packet has to be of a format that we can, inter that we can detect and intercept as, uh, you know, and detect that this is a congestion feedback mechanism uh, notification before we send it to the VM. But it's basically just going through the same data path that normal traffic goes on a virtual network. So whatever it is, VXLAN or VLAN or whatever it is, it'll tra traverse the same path. And then at the destination, um, it'll get intercepted. All right, thank you. It's a comment more than a question uh, well, about your implementation. Um, I'm sorry, was, I'm told we're out of time, so let's take let's take it offline. Yeah, let's, let's 
Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll have the comment. This is going to be last question. All right. Last question. Uh, yeah. So uh, for implementation, you could have used OpenFlow, where you could use different tables for uh, QoS setting and then manage the bandwidth according to that, and you can actually write the flows accordingly. Did you consider doing like that, or what's the limitation? Uh, I think that's an implementation detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you didn't have you know, to go the through end, the Linux kernel model. So, so OpenFlow is a basically a protocol, right? But at the end of the day, you need a real mechanism that provides the enforcement. So we're using our own protocol, but uh, the mechanism at, at the bottom is probably the same. But yeah, we could we could swap out the protocol with OpenFlow. I'm not sure I see a big advantage of doing that. Thank you. Thank you.